The Living History Program of Duke University is honored to present to you an interview with the Honorable Terry Sanford, President Emeritus of Duke University and Professor of Public Policy Studies, formerly United States Senator and Governor of the State of North Carolina. He will be interviewed this afternoon by William H. Chafe, Alice Mary Baldwin, Professor of History and Chair of the History Department at Duke University, Professor Oli Holstey, George V. Allen Professor of Political Science, and myself, William Asher, Professor of Public Policy Studies and Political Science and Director of the Sanford Institute of Public Policy here at Duke University. I'd like to ask Professor Chafe to begin the questions. <coughs> Governor Sanford, the <coughs> relationship between the state and the country was a very pivotal one during your uh, term as governor. Um, I know that as you prepared uh, to take the office of governor, you knew full well that civil rights would be one of the most important issues facing you. I wonder to what extent, as you entered the office, you had a strategy already in mind for how you would deal with uh, the raging protests that were beginning and, in fact, had begun in North Carolina with the sit-in movement. Did you already have a... Well, you had to have two strategies, really. You had to have a strategy for the long run of what you wanted to accomplish for the state, and you had to have a strategy for how to stay alive, and I mean politically alive, mm -hmm. because during the campaign even, this was becoming such an uh, explosive issue that it uh, would indeed uh, defeat all good purposes if it got out of hand. So the question was how to keep it in hand and how to still get it done, and basically the strategy was that the Supreme Court decision was a proper decision, that the human rights of uh, black citizens had uh, for, forever uh, been denied and restricted, and we had to bring all of that to an end. And how did you do it in a political climate, and how did you do it at that particularly crucial period of American history and North Carolina history? How did we get across that uh, uh, in good order, and, uh, and how did we uh, pose the questions, and how did we make the advances and, uh, and keep on going to continue it. Uh, mm -hmm. So yes, I had a strategy mm -hmm. and I thought about it. As a matter of fact, I had begun to keep a little notebook on my dresser after Dr. Frank Graham's defeat almost 10 years earlier with little notes of how I would handle a particular mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. and not get uh, caught in the same kind of uh, disaster that the state was caught in as a result of uh, his defeat pretty much on that issue. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'd given a whole lot of thought to it. I wonder to what extent uh, uh, and how difficult the decision was for you to send your, your own child to a desegregated school after, at that point in time. Was that, was that part of your sense of providing leadership? Well, of course, it had to be done. And <coughs> it, so in a way, you'd view that as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to exploit it, however, and consequently, I didn't take the children to school. But my daughter was in about the fourth grade, and uh, my son was in the second, I believe, uh, um, um, of course, they went in the middle of the year. Mm -hmm. At any rate, uh, uh, Margaret Rose took them to the school. It wasn't very far from the governor's mansion. If we had jumped over, leapfrog that to go to some other school, it would have just been such an obvious slap. And uh, so Hugh Cannon, my ad uh, administrative assistant, and Margaret Rose took the children over there, and I thought we would downplay it. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we didn't downplay it. Uh, USIA sent it all over the world as if it were a big deal. I really mm -hmm. didn't think it was a big deal. I just thought it was something that had to be done, and in a way, a, a good thing we could do it. I wonder to what extent uh, during, these period, dur during this period of time, uh, uh, you were in regular communication with either Robert Kennedy or with the president uh, about these issues, and were you giving giving them advice, or were, were you in consultation with them about how uh, you were proceeding here in North Carolina? Well, I think they were watching us with some uh, sense of satisfaction because uh, uh, I wouldn't say we were the only state in the South, but we uh, North Carolina stood out in the way it was handling this. Mm -hmm. And uh, they paid a lot of attention to it, but uh, I didn't need any advice from them. I knew a whole lot more about how to deal with that issue than either of them. Mm -hmm. It took them a while. <laughs> well, you know, I grew up in it. Right. Could, could you elaborate a little bit about 
your short run strategy for you, as you say, to stay politically alive. What were some of the elements of that strategy? Well, I think you simply had to mute the issue wherever you could. That's not to fool the people. I think most people understood that this issue had to be dealt with. I truly think that most people wanted to keep down the explosive nature of it. And I think they appreciated the fact that we wouldn't let it be the dominant issue. I kept making, quite properly, the dominant issue of my campaign was education. And I never made a speech that I didn't make it on education. And we took care of this other issue as we moved along. We just didn't let it become central. And I suppose that was the basic strategy. Uh, we couldn't let it become central. We couldn't handle it. Did, did you feel that uh, your opposition overplayed the issue? Or did they also understand that this was something that needed oh, to no, be? Oh, no, this was the worst racist campaign North Carolina ever had with the uh, well, probably without the exception, Pro probably the Frank Graham race was bad enough, but there you had a, a Willis Smith was a very decent person and sort of caught up into that by the campaign surrounding him. Uh, and I think it was the central part of, of my opponent in the second primary. Uh, this was his great issue, uh, the uh, preservation of the school system as it was. Now. Uh, it's not up to me to comment on him or his motives, except to say it was a blatant racist campaign, no question about it. When the demonstrations became <clears throat> uh, particularly severe in 63, uh, and there was one occasion I remember when uh, there was a demonstration, I believe, outside the governor's mansion and the North Carolina Symphony Orchestra, I believe, was playing inside. Uh, y you had a very effective way of, in some ways, handling those demonstrations. Could you describe? what your fundamental approach was to those kinds of uh, confrontations. Well, you know, you didn't have a wall around the uh, governor's mansion, and I always thought it was a symbolically bad thing that we that they built a wall around the mansion a couple of terms after I served. People used to take shortcuts through the mansion yard, go into the houses over behind it, and I thought that was a nice touch. Well, the night of the symph symphony ball, we had started uh, the symphony ball to raise money for an endowment for the symphony. And so we would get, I, th I think maybe Eleanor Steva was there that night. Anyhow, we would always get a, a star and, uh, uh, and then we had uh, uh, the North Carolina uh, Symphony. And um, uh, so when it became apparent that uh, a great group of students were gather were, was gathering outside, uh, I said to Ben Swalling, says, let me go out and talk to them, said, I'm, I'm very good and uh, we've carried the symphony to all of the black schools in North Carolina. And I said, nothing doing. <laughs> you know, and I had on tails, which is bad enough. And I said to the highway patrolman, I don't even want you out here. I said, I must walk out there by myself mm -hmm. and talk to them. And that's the way to do it. We don't want to carry a big crowd and delegation out here. Well, later on when uh, I looked at the pictures that night. There was a, a, the highway patrolman standing behind me holding his hat down. He, he had come on anyhow, but I didn't know he was there. <laughs> and, and so, um, um, first of all, I didn't view him as a hostile group. And if I would tended to do it, I, wouldn't have, I would have pretended that it wasn't hostile, but it wasn't. And uh, they were you know, they were singing when I went out there, and I said, keep on singing. We didn't come here to sing. Oh, well, uh, then uh, uh, they, there was a little bit of exchange like that, not really with me, but, and then somebody turned out to be the president of the student body out there, yelled out uh, something to this effect, be quiet and let our great governor speak, and I knew I had it under control right <laughs> at that point. And so I invited them to come to the Capitol the following day. We'd talk about it, and a great many of them did, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and they, uh, uh, you know, it added quite a bit of life. That was the, the people that paid the ticket to get in the match and got their money's worth that night. <laughs> and it was, a, a, it was an orderly thing. 
uh, and you know, I I had always had a certain uh, level of admiration, a considerable level of admiration, for those students who were willing to get out and uh, risk their bruises and things that might come, uh, in order to state their opinions. So I, I always had a, had a very sympathetic attitude toward them. I never saw that as a threat. Mm -hmm. Or, or, and it might have been a more of a threat, to, it might have turned bad, but I never saw it that way. Mm -hmm. And I generally viewed those demonstrations as people that had something really uh, legitimate to say and that we ought to uh, not thwart them, but ought to at least accommodate it. And, and I followed that, not just that night, but all mm -hmm. the way through. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You indicated a moment ago that you had always made education, one of the primary themes of your campaign, and I think it's fair to say that uh, you're still thought of as an education governor. How were you able to deal with the racial issue and the education issue without having the two of the, the one of them simply dominate the other? That is, what kind of a strategy do you have? Well, it was very easy to let the uh the brush fire of the race issue just get totally out of hand and consume the countryside. It did in a lot of states. And there were some people uh, in other states running and trying to stand uh, for a, a, a forward-looking position uh, who simply were overwhelmed. Uh, you may or may not remember that George Wallace was one of them. He got beat by Patterson. George, George was the liberal forward-looking person had said after that, after he got defeated, uh, his I think his famous statement was, "I'll never be out segged again." And I always knew George really wasn't sincere about all of these political things, or at least in my opinion, uh, he was a much better man than he presented himself. Uh, so it was a dangerous situation. But I had started out six years earlier determining that I was going to make education the center of what I tried to do in public life and that I was going to try to make North Carolina's educational system rise from its low position to, to better achievement. And I had uh, paid a lot of attention to that. I had planned it in detail. I had a, a, a point by point program from libraries to dropout programs and the whole array of things that would improve the schools. And so I determined I wasn't going to let that issue be snatched away from me. Also, it was good political strategy to keep the people's uh, view on something very positive that they cared about. And, and that simply uh, made it more difficult to get the race issue in a dominant position. I could not have won if the race issue had been the only issue because my views were were not uh, such that they would would have been accepted then. They are, of course, accepted today, but uh, it would have been very difficult then. One of the uh, things that you were justly known for throughout the country was the creation of these schools, such as the Governor's School, and uh, uh, I believe the School of the Arts as well. Was that not yes. during your administration? I, I wonder whether where, where those ideas came from and whether they were... Uh, something that was part of this long-range plan or uh, something that, that emerged during your governorship? I think a governor, any other public official, or does, not only that, any university official, uh, or any person in an executive position, uh, needs to make an, effort, uh, an extra effort to invite creative ideas. Mm -hmm. And I've always tried to do that. Now, the, uh, I got John Ely, uh, who uh, was at uh, Chapel Hill and was taking leave, and a person who, had, a young woman who had worked with me, knew John's wife and knew him, and she said that he was uh, taking leave. Why don't you get him to come over and work with you? He had already given me a memo outlining uh, a film board concept, like the Canadian and Scandinavian film boards, a public film board, that uh, made uh, documentaries mm -hmm. to preserve the culture and history and so I had that line by the telephone in the in the library at the mansion. I read it I, for, for the first time and uh, so then I called John Ely and he came over and he stayed. Now uh, John's a very creative person and he came up with the idea of let's have a high school 
in business and the new techniques. See, computers were hardly here, but you knew they were coming, mm -hmm. uh, something entirely new. Uh, and then he said, let's have a school of science. We're talking about high schools mm -hmm. and residential high schools so we could concentrate uh, the, the effort. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the math and science, uh, then a couple of other ideas, but those three schools that, mm -hmm. uh, that he wanted to, to, to get going. Well, we just didn't get everything done. Uh, he later presented the School of Math, uh, or si math and Science, they added math to Governor Hunt, mm -hmm. and that really go went back to John Ely's idea. Mm -hmm. The School of the Arts was a little bit different. Uh, I was with uh, uh, Dr. Fole, uh, Jim Fole, who Winston-Salem, and father had been a bishop in the Moravian Church, and he ran a school for musicians in the western part of the state at Brevard uh, every summer. And I went up there one summer, and I had been, uh, we'd had the governor's school go in, the summer school program, and it, I was impressed with the immense amount of uh, artistic talent that that brought out. We didn't get them together for mm -hmm. artistic talent, but for academic achievement. But the things that they did on their own helped reinforce my feeling that we had so much untapped artistic talent, especially in eastern North Carolina, where that type of thing had been neglected in terms of training. So uh, I asked a fool, I said, why don't we have a Juilliard in North Carolina? He said, nobody ever started one. Well, that was a terrible thing to say to me. Uh, <laughs> on the way back, I rode out on a yellow pad that I always carried in the car, uh, uh, instructions or an order uh, to set up a commission to study the uh, uh, putting a Juilliard. Uh, now, it later got to be a much broader concept than just a conservatory. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 Giannini, Vittorio Giannini, was at Brevard when I was there. I didn't see him. He'd had a little heart attack and he was in the local hospital. But Hugh Cannon uh, and whoever else was with us went over to, to visit him, and they began to tell me what a great person he was. So we put him on this commission, ultimately made him president of the school when we got it started. A couple of unique things about it is that we have an undergraduate component there as well as a, 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 coll a collegiate level. And we are different from Juilliard in that we insist on the liberal arts along with the music. And it's tough on them, but it's in the broader uh, sense uh, of their lives in the future, they're much better prepared mm -hmm. to be artists by being better educated also. So I think it's a unique thing, and now with the film board coming on, it's, it's a major innovation, and a few states have, have begun to copy it, but I think it's, uh, was a, turned out to be a very significant thing that uh, just sort of arose one Sunday afternoon uh, in Brevard, North Carolina. One thing that may puzzle <coughs> some people is that... I might say, without uh, I, I drop one thought, John Ely took charge of it, of putting it together, and that's another reason I think it went so well. well a puzzle, I think, to some people would be that the governorship, the office of the governor in North Carolina is generally considered one of the weakest in the country, certainly at the time that you were there. That is limited to one term, uh, no line item veto, and so on and so forth. And yet you were able to achieve a good deal uh, during your governorship. What, uh, to what do you attribute that? Well, the, the governor's uh, uh, office is much more powerful than people think. Now, the limiting thing is, was the one term. In a way, that wasn't limiting. That was uh, liberating. You didn't have to worry about getting reelected. And I, John Kennedy bothered me a little bit about not doing two or three things that I thought ought to be done, and he said to me, we'll do those in the next term. And that, I thought then, that's a terrible uh, view of things. Not that I thought John Kennedy was terrible, but it just, he wasn't moving as fast as I thought he should. And he was worried about the political backlash. But I didn't worry about the second term. I didn't have any other ambition to be anything else politically. And, uh, 
so uh, I was free to move it on. And, and I think that I would have backed down. Would I have uh, uh, stood for the tax increases that we had, especially such a, a, a politically vulnerable thing as a tax on food? Now, I didn't really put a tax on food. I took the 50 exemptions of sales tax off, and food was one of them. Uh, but in any event, you know, for 25 years, I got uh, plagued with being called uh, the uh, food tax Terry or something like that. Uh, but I moved it on because I knew I had four years to do something that I would hope would be significant. And every day we started off, what can we do today to shake them up and get, move them on and get something done? And we were always looking for ideas. And the governor has a lot of power. At one place, and certainly then, the legislature looked to the governor as the leader of the legislature. Uh, and they might not have admitted that, but I think they might have. And if the governor wanted something, they, they by and large, wanted to do it. They looked to the governor for leadership. You started off the uh, uh, first year in the old capital, and the poor legislator couldn't get upstairs to go to work without passing my office, and we nabbed him if we needed him. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I had just almost total cooperation from the members of the legislature, so almost anything we tried to do, including the tippy toe bill, you know, the, the School of the Arts, you can see how that could have been ridiculed out of town, but the legislature supported it fairly, finally, over, overwhelmingly. And I think that uh, uh, relationship helped a lot. But just at that time, the prestige of the governor's office, if the governor called somebody and said, uh, we want to send this young fellow to Europe on a, uh, he's a great uh, young pianist and we'd like to get a scholarship, how about giving $3,000, uh, we'll have it right there. That type of uh, uh, support uh, that the governor had and the type of prestige, not that the governor necessarily, but the governor's office had. And when you just could get magic done if you took those tools and used them. Let me just move you just ahead just a moment because you've raised an interesting question and that is that knowing that you cannot succeed yourself gives you a sense of urgency. Uh, certainly one of the current hot button issues is the whole issue of term limits. I wonder if you just take a few minutes out and talk about your sense of, of what that issue, what that might mean. Would you be, uh, given your own experience, do you believe, for example, that putting limitations on terms might liberate Well, politicians? if you're not going to put, if you're going to put limitations on terms, you ought to first think about lengthening the term. Uh, one of the biggest uh, handicaps of trying to be in the House of Representatives is the time you get there, you got to start running again. And that puts all kinds of burdens on people to compromise and to uh, uh, fail to, to move uh, boldly on something. I think if you had a four-year term, uh, you might talk about three, four-year terms. But for the moment, about the only stability we get in the Congress is somebody that's there for seven or eight terms and then can, now one or two of them will be arrogant and abusive in their power, but most of them use that time to, one, get entrenched where they don't have to worry about not getting reelected, and that's not all bad, because they can be defeated, as, as evidence in, by this last election. Uh, I, I have never been uh, of, a, of the opinion that, that term limitations would make many changes, that you, there's such a turnover anyhow, and you do need in the House of Representatives a level of stability that's very difficult to get because of the two-year limitation. And I think the two-year limitation plus a half dozen, whatever they decide on terms, I think that uh, would be very destabilizing. Governor, you said that, that when you were governor, you found that it was liberating. What were your thoughts about your career after the governorship? I didn't have any political ambition, really. I didn't want to go to the United States Senate, and uh, you know, uh, I always declared that under no circumstances would I go to the Senate, but later on I <laughs> lost my mind and did. Uh, I just didn't, uh, first of all, I had made up my mind early that I would not devote my whole life to politics. 
I didn't think that uh, if you looked at it sort of toward the end of the road that it was uh, all that satisfying. I didn't know exactly what I would do, but I had a lot of options. Uh, and uh, I hadn't given much uh, thought to what I would do next because at least from the ninth grade, I'd concentrated on being governor. Mm -hmm. And what did you see those options to be at, at that point? Because this, this is such an important question for our students who are wondering about career transitions. Well, I have, uh, I've said to, to students uh, that if you get into politics, you ought to get in with a, a frame of mind that winning is not everything and not the most important thing, that you better stand for something. Because if you don't stand for something and win, it's going to be ultimately such a holler uh, experience that why do it and why go to all of the stress and strain and trouble of running and winning if you're not going to uh, stand for something and if standing for something defeats you so be it you, you know it's uh, uh, now uh, I had in mind at that time that it might be possible, but see, this was so absurd that people would laugh if I'd say it, so I, it's like I never said when I was in college that I, you know, sometime I'm gonna run for governor. I would have been laughed at, or at least I would have been too embarrassed ever to have said that. But I crossed my mind as I saw Kennedy and saw Washington and saw what was there and how they operated, it occurred to me the time maybe had come that a Southerner could run for president. But I didn't have that idea going into the governor's office. But I might have had it coming out, but not to an intense degree. I did think that, uh, well, you know what, the, things are changing, the Supreme Court decisions, the uh, whole uh, area of uh, integration had removed the burden that Southerners had always had uh, since the, uh, the Civil War. Anyhow, since the race issue became a big issue, uh, since that time, and certainly in this century, it's very difficult for a Southerner, Woodrow Wilson, but he really by that time was not a Southerner. Uh, and so I had, uh, I had begun to think about uh, that possibility. I can say now in retrospect, I never did think about it uh, with the kind of passion that I thought about being governor, uh, and consequently I never did go after it with that same kind of determination. Uh, uh, I can't say that I sit here with any regret that I didn't, but, uh, but, but if I had, uh, now I'd say I'd like to see what would happen if I had. <laughs> what, what might have you done if you'd had that passion for the presidency, what steps might you have taken after leaving the governor's mansion? Oh, I wouldn't have run for anything else. Uh, the truth of the matter, I never did, uh, I not only didn't uh, uh, have an ambition to be president of Duke, it would never have crossed my mind uh, in, the, in the wildest moment that uh, I would ever be offered the presidency of Duke. But once I was president of Duke, in the tradition of Woodrow Wilson, I couldn't have planned it better if I had had the, the intensity in that particular ambition, I couldn't have had a better base. And, and I, you know, I almost uh, stumbled into it anyhow. Was this issue ever raised with the trustees of Duke that whether uh, you as, as a possible president of Duke might be simply using this as a stepping stone to the White House? Well, a fellow who had always been my enemy said I was using it so I could get back into running for governor again. That's about as far as that went, and uh, uh, he didn't amount to much. Uh, no, you know, uh, it occurred to me that I couldn't get into politics, and I would make a great mistake to try to use Duke as a platform for politics. In the first place, I suspect I'd never have really tested it, but if you look at the board of trustees that elected me president of Duke and had only they voted in the first primary, I probably wouldn't have been in the second primary. Uh, they were uh, more likely to be people that uh, 
were associates of Luther Hodges and uh, a little more conservative than I was in the political sense. But they certainly elected me president of Duke, and I intended to be president of all of Duke and all the constituencies, and I certainly didn't ever intend to do anything to embarrass Duke. But when uh, the 1972 uh, presidential campaign was developing, uh, I wasn't in it, uh, but and didn't have any plans and didn't see how I could, really. But then students at Chapel Hill and some Duke students began to get up a petition to put my name on the ballot because it was obvious that George Wallace was going to carry this state and they didn't see and, and McGovern was coming on. And uh, at any rate, I then dropped a note to the uh, trustee saying, that's all the stuff's been in the paper. I didn't put it in the paper and when you meet here next week, uh, I'll tell you about it. And I figured that, you know, would end it and not have me in an embarrassing position. Well, so on the day of the trustees, I walked in the office and Mrs. Mims said, uh, Tom Perkins uh, left you a note. Uh, now, Tom Perkins was a close friend of uh, President of Nixon's who um, was, of course, running on the, for the nomination. Uh, well, he was running for re-election. He had been a close friend of, of President Nixon's and from New York, and we'd been friendly enough. But she said, you know, she indicated to me this was about the campaign. And I said, oh, my goodness, and I sort of opened it up, you know, because as if it might blow up or something. It said, Dear Terry, I understand that uh, the students have petitioned you to run for president. I understand the filing fee is $2,000, and I enclose my personal check. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that, that's a terrible thing happened, because then I had to move it on. <laughs> Before we, I, this is a really important thing to talk some more about, I think, but I, I wonder if you would uh, tell us a little bit about a, a story I heard the other night uh, about uh, your being uh, recruited to run Lyndon Johnson's campaign for re-election in 1968 uh, and uh, the extent to which that uh, experience in national politics. Well, you know, Lyndon uh, got uh, terribly irritated with me for being the only Southerner in a leadership position to be for Kennedy. And uh, Lyndon had a reputation for not forgetting things like that. Well, uh, uh, I figured that I knew Lyndon better than I knew John Kennedy at that time when they were nominated. But I wasn't going to let that bother me. Uh, I was told that somebody recommended me for a job. I think it was to head the poverty program. And he says, no, a thousand times, no, don't mention his name to me again. Uh, I don't know whether he said that or not, but I wouldn't be surprised, sound like him. Uh, however, as we went along, uh, and he asked me to do a couple of things, and I was in the White House on occasion, uh, he warmed considerably. I was already warm to him. I liked what he was doing. I liked the poverty program. He sent... Uh, he set his poverty program up around our program. He, that was the, where he got the original ideas. They didn't follow through like uh, I would have preferred to see, but uh, he saw that. And, and, uh, and then in the, his reelection, I was very strong in his support, and our candidate for governor was a little bit worried about being for London. And when Johnson came here to make his... Uh, uh, speech. Now, this is when he was first running, uh, after he assumed office as vice president. And um, uh, uh, anyhow, Mrs. Moore was very much for him, and it wasn't long before Governor Moore was for him. Uh, and he thought I had something to do with that. Uh, and anyhow, I was strongly supporting him. I don't know that I had a thing to do with uh, convincing Governor Moore. I think he came to the conclusion it was a the proper thing to do, and, and he was a very good man. So uh, by the time Lyndon got back in office, he was beginning to call on me to do things. I didn't want a job uh, uh, under any circumstances. Um, I, wouldn't, I would just wouldn't go to Washington for a job. I just didn't want it. I wasn't interested in that, and, it, and I didn't see any great 
purpose in it. Uh, he did, uh, uh, as we went along, uh, uh, invite me to various things, Margaret Rose and me to various things up there, more so than we had in the Kennedy administration. I was sort of reluctant to go to the White House during the Kennedy administration. It really wasn't all that politically useful. In fact, it was a detriment uh, to carry Kennedy's burden in this state. Uh, and for good reasons, I mean, uh, uh, honorable reasons, he was unpopular. Uh, so uh, uh, I would go when Lyndon invited us, and we, uh, over a period of time, got to be better friends. I never did agree with the Vietnam War, and I wrote him three or four letters, and I started every letter out. Uh, I'm not keeping a copy of this letter. I'm not trying to establish any political position. I just want to give you a couple of thoughts that I sort of come on to. And, and uh, I think those letters are in the library out there. Somebody sent me one of them. But uh, anyhow, I didn't keep a copy because I told him I didn't. And I, wa I really was trying to say, you are getting in such a mess. Let's find a way to get out of it. And so, you know, I, I, I was probably the only person. He was always uh, peeved with Fulbright. Well, of course, I didn't have any power to do anything, and I wasn't very vocal about it anyhow. Uh, well, as he began to run for his full second term, uh, he sent me word that he'd like me to be his campaign manager so by Larry O'Brien and Henry Hall Wilson. And I said, that's ridiculous. You know, not get into anything like that. Well, I went up there to see him at his request a couple of times, and I kept saying to him, no point in my being your campaign manager as long as you continue the bombing in Vietnam, because neither, not, not I nor anyone else uh, can help you win this election, because you're not going to win it. And you know, you've got to stop the bombing. Well, it finally, uh, he uh, and Henry and, and Larry uh, convinced me, and I, you know, it would be a great adventure. So uh, I had about agreed to, to do it, and I was up there uh, on Sunday afternoon, and uh, I told him I would come back. I had to go take little Terry, who was in seventh, eighth grade, I reckon, uh, on spring break, and I'd promised to take him to. Florida Keys. I said, I take my son down there. I talk to you about this next week. I come in here Sunday. Well, Sunday he was going to make his speech on the bombing. They met me at the uh, airport, and I sent Terry on home on Piedmont. And uh, I read that speech riding back into town. I, this is a great speech. He really did stop the bombing. Nobody ever heard that speech. Nobody ever wrote about it. Not many people ever read it. They lost it because of the last sentence. And, um, well, it, kind of, it was kind of funny because uh, we spent all afternoon in the White House outlining strategy and how we'd go about offsetting the Wisconsin vote on Tuesday and how I was going to have to go home and talk to Governor Scott and Dan Moore and be sure that I got the home base in shape. Was, if I were going to do this, I had to get solid at home. So I was going to leave that afternoon and go home, and then I'd be back up there. And after the Wisconsin uh, disaster on Tuesday, when McCarthy was going to carry it, either on Wednesday or Thursday, we'd have a press conference, and I'm the manager, and we're off and running. So uh, I get ready to leave, and and uh, and the uh, there's obviously something going on. And uh, they tell me that when you get to Fayetteville, because I was going to fly down about 6 o'clock, uh, give us a call. First said, what are you doing? And, I, you know, I thought he was inviting me to come hear the speech, although I needed to go home. Well, I went on home, and uh, Marvin Watson was the, the number one assistant, and he had been called out of our meeting to see the president. And uh, he said, call me when you get there said the president's changed his mind about something. And I thought he was going to bring that Texas crowd. I thought they had gotten upset that they were being eased out of running the campaign. 
And I said to Callan, I said, well, I'm glad of it. Uh, anyhow, I flew home and I uh, had my car there, I suppose, because I drove in uh, and uh, Margaret Rose and the children uh, met me at the back door. Did you know he was going to say that? I said, oh, yeah, I read that speech, all but wrote it. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I said, you really know that? I said, everybody's calling you. Bobby Kennedy's called you. And it wasn't ringing true, you know, there's something wrong. When I had called Marvin from the airport, because I couldn't wait, he said, well, he's in with the president right now. I said, well, he can't talk to you. And said, Congressman so-and-so said, he's not going to let him do it. said, well, that struck me again as a little bit odd, but I thought wasn't going to let him stop this war. Uh, well, anyhow, I went on. <laughs> By that time, uh, the phone rang, and it was Manly you back from Charleston. And he said, what about that? Did you know he was going to do that? I said, no, wait a minute, what did man say? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first time I knew it, that I was out of a job. <laughs> that's a wonderful story. Yeah. There, there's another story that I heard a little bit about when you were president of Duke, um, about the ITT Corporation coming to you after uh, the ITT uh, scandal in Chile and asked you to, uh, to look into that. Could you... Elaborate on that? Well, uh, Harold Janine hired a headhunter to get him a committee to be the committee for his concept of a foreign study scholarship program. He wanted to bring a couple of students from every country where ITT had a, a, some kind of an operation, which would have been about 30 countries. Uh, and then he wanted to take U.S. students and send them to these various countries, not necessarily all of them, but anywhere they wanted to go. And he wanted a scholarship committee. And he didn't know me and I didn't know him, but I thought that was a great, interesting thing to do. And it was certainly compatible with the presidency of Duke. So uh, uh, we got it started. And um, it turned out to be, over the years, a very good thing. They, after they sold out the European telecommunications and gave a few million dollars for the school, they, uh, they quit that program. But it was, uh, it was a very interesting, that's my entry into uh, ITT. Now, about that time, um, the, uh, the Chile situation developed and ITT was accused of being involved in that. And that was also about the time that you had the Belgian corporate uh, scandal and people overseas were paying, American co uh, companies overseas were paying bribes and you were getting stockholder suits. Well, a president of another university that was on this scholarship committee wrote uh, Janine in a huff and in longhand and uh, resigned from this committee and wrote me and said, I, th I would think you'd like to do likewise. I wrote him back, why would I like to do likewise? This incident had already broken when we accepted this. We hadn't gotten all the publicity. And I said, I didn't, uh, it's got nothing to do with what we're doing. And I said, this is a good program. I'm not even thinking about it. Well, that really pleased Janine. Uh, when he found out about it. And a couple of years later, he asked me to be on the board of ITT, which was one of the more interesting things. And, uh, and from Duke's point of view, we did very well uh, in getting their support for, as you know, four or five things here. But, but then, when this stockholder suit was brought, only two people on the board that hadn't been on the board when all of that happened and under the law is then spelled out if you a stockholder can't really sue so the directors have to decide if they want to take up the suit well obviously they didn't but they are uh, disqualified from making a decision without an independent study so Tom Cassie who later became very instrumental in helping in so many ways at Duke, a Duke graduate, and I conducted this study. What was the, uh, the part that they played? And we had the, uh, an independent counsel, and we reported to the court, and not only here, but the, in uh, 
Nigeria and a couple of other places where accusations were made and Spain and what the Spain subsidiary was doing. So we had a very interesting thing of looking at all of it. And we came to the conclusion that the ITT management hadn't done anything and the court agreed with us. How did you manage to uh, be so involved in that while at the same time running the university? Worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> when you, uh, we, we've been talking a little, a little bit about foreign policy in the last few questions. Uh, when you uh, had your great change of heart and decided that perhaps you would be willing to sit in the Senate, uh, if memory serves me correctly, you went to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee yeah. uh, upon arrival in the Senate. Um, as a freshman senator, uh, how were you able to do that? That's a very, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a tough ticket uh, for a freshman. Well, I asked to get on the uh, Finance Committee, and I asked to get on the Appropriations Committee, and uh, I asked to get on the Armed Forces Committee. There are four major committees. And they wouldn't put me on any of those, so they gave me that as a booby prize, which I really wanted all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't mean I schemed to get it by asking for the others, but I didn't think I'd get it. Mm -hmm. uh, in your term as uh, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, what were some of the more interesting issues that you had to deal with as a member of that committee? Well, Bill, Ish Bill Asher was the central person and the most uh, significant thing that I had anything to do with, and we decided, well, when I, when I was running, the uh, question of the Contra War was an issue in the campaign. You know, here we are down there fighting a war, uh, you fought against it. And uh, my opponent uh, uh, was pretty much for it, as, you know, most everybody that, that, that hadn't thought that through. It, it, well, I wasn't going to be for it, except I didn't want to let that be an issue. So I said, I'm not for it, but I'm not going up and pull the rug out from under the president and start trying to run foreign policy. But I'm going to tell him a better way to do it. And then and inevitably I'd say, you know, I'd get asked finally by the president, well, yeah, what is your better way, your know, secret plan like Nixon had in China? I said, we're going to start a mini Marshall plan. Uh, and uh, work for economic development for all of those countries and get out of this civil war business. That's the way to, to well, it sort of got a good ring to it. And, and so when I got there, I had to go forward with it. And I thought it'd be a great mistake to uh, just do another Kissinger study or another uh, uh, a good neighbor thing that started with and, and uh, the Alliance for Progress that uh, Kennedy had. Uh, I thought another study, and besides, we didn't want to cover all of Latin America. So we uh, devised this plan for having uh, foundations pay for it, though with a resolution supporting it out of the Foreign Relations Committee, and, but not any money. Two or three reasons. One, it was quicker to do it the other way. Second, it removed the taint of this being just another uh, study from the North. And, and you remember we found out that uh, the Kissinger report, which had come out from the Caribbean and uh, that area generally several years before, when they had the press conference coming up, somebody said suddenly said, for heaven's sakes, we don't have a Spanish translation. So we decided that this was not going to be another American study, that this would be done in Spanish. And fortunately, Bill handles the Spanish better than he does English. Uh, <laughs> and, but I got, uh, I related it to Duke, got the money, uh, I suppose, given to Duke from three or four foundations, Carnegie, Ford, uh, MacArthur, one or two others. Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Uh, and a couple of them volunteered to do it when they found out we were doing this. And, and that's how I got, that. I would say that's the most uh, significant thing because uh, it's endured. Uh, the uh, they still have a, a group that meets uh, frequently out of that uh, Economic Commission report. Uh, and that was one of the more interesting things. Of course, I got to vote uh, against the Gulf War. And uh, in the Foreign Relations uh, Committee, we uh, certainly had the very interesting period of uh, properly trying to properly structure our new approach uh, toward Russia. Um, 
the uh, uh, we had the uh, we had some very interesting things in trying to keep open the lines with China, as you remember the uh, uh, the efforts of a great many people in this country to cut things off, and some effort in, in China to cut them off. And I felt that we had to keep open those uh, ties that that country had been closed so long that it had to be bad for the world if we made them close again. Uh, we had the Canadian uh, Treaty, the North American Treaty. That uh, So there were some fairly interesting things going on during that period of time. I probably got in more trouble than anything else, than anything else I did by being against the Gulf War, but I still think I, that we didn't take the right approach there. One of the enduring issues uh, in American government, which uh, surfaces uh, at least at once every generation, or perhaps more often, is the whole relationship between the Congress and the President in the conduct of foreign affairs. And it continues to be, certainly today, an issue. We have controversy about the War Powers Resolution and other uh, such uh, uh, measures. I wonder if you'd just, uh, based on your experience, and of course beyond not just your six years on the Foreign Relations Committee, if you have some thoughts about this enduring question in American well, politics. Well, it, it seems to me that foreign relations simply has to be directed by the president. It's far too complicated, and almost every time the congressman, Congress uh, puts its hand in it, it messes it up. It certainly has, uh, I don't know that we would ever have had a, uh, an adequate foreign aid program because it was too intertwined with uh, military aid. But we never really got a chance. They, they, they never voted for an authorization bill while I was up there. They killed every, you know, they pigeonholed every one of them and went forward with uh, continuing resolutions. Uh, worked out fairly well, but partially because the president had a fair amount of, uh, of, of power and, and partially because the appropriations bill, uh, the appropriations committee took care of it instead of the foreign relations committee and keeping the thing going. So uh, uh, I would say by and large that uh, Congress has uh, put its uh, hand into foreign relations more than it should, that it, that it is, and the Constitution essentially uh, gives that power to the President. Now the advice and consent provisions, uh, surely we ought to have that kind of check and support of the President and, and treaties. Uh, and appointments too, but those are just like other appointments. Many appointments need the, the consent of the Senate. And all of that uh, works, I believe, to give a very good balance. I wouldn't change the structure very much, if at all, in terms of uh, the way the Constitution has laid it out and the way, by and large, history has laid it out. Do you feel that the administration uh, dealt fairly with your initiatives to try to do work in foreign policy. For example, with the Central American Commission, the administration was not at all pleased with that initiative. Well, we didn't have a, a, an administration that thought the Contra War was wrong. They were pumping money into it, and uh, they didn't really want to, uh, that resolved in a way, and then they certainly did not want uh, the uh, the Sandinista Party to be involved in uh, the running of Nicaragua, and then when the uh, election was held, uh, they stayed constantly irritated with President Chamorro because uh, she realized that they had to have reconciliation, and she reached out for everybody, uh, including Ortego and including keeping Ortega's brother in that, I think she's done one of the more brilliant jobs in diplomacy in the world. A small area, of course, and not the great impact on the rest of the world. But she has taken a very difficult situation with the continuing hostility from the U.S. administration. Now, I don't mean it's continued the last couple of years, but I don't think they have paid much attention to it in a positive way. But she's done a great job with uh, very, very little support from us in holding that together. Uh, so there was that hostility. Uh, the, the administration simply wasn't in favor of doing what we were in favor of doing. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it pretty well got done, not because of us, but we helped. 
I reckon. Do you think that, uh, could you describe what the Bush administration uh, did by way of putting pressure on you, or were you more Nobody or less in an invulnerable situation? On me. They'd snarl at you a little when, after I said I wasn't going to uh, vote for the, you know, I think 48 people voted against the Gulf War, mm -hmm. including Sam Nunn. But uh, a week later, we had our basketball team over at the White House, and uh, the only pressure on me, the president came down the line and spoke to this fella, and here I am. And then he spoke to this fella, he didn't even look at me, <laughs> and then walked on down the line. That, that was my punishment for being against his war. But, me, uh, you know, that was mild. I, I didn't mind that. <laughs> but let me, let me pick up on on what to some viewers may seem at least a partial contradiction. A moment ago, you felt that the Constitution and common sense combined to give the president real command over foreign affairs, and yet, uh, in a situation like the Gulf War, you felt it necessary to oppose the president. Is there, is there a contradiction there? No, because we're talking about a declaration of war that clearly, at least I was, that uh, I contended that was a war, and, and so did Sam Nunn. Uh, no, I don't. I think that's a constitutional uh, duty. It would have been very easy to say that's his war, that we don't have anything to do with it. But uh, we are required. Now, once that vote was taken, I supported totally everything we did, supported every effort we made for the enlisted men, uh, and I think that's the proper way to play it. But I think uh, the Senate uh, has the constitutional responsibility to make its decision on that, and every senator has the responsibility of expressing a view. And it was a bipartisan objection to that is not totally. Naturally, most of the Republicans would support their president. But uh, that was a close vote. It could have gone the other way. Now, what would have happened? That's, that's, that's the next uh, th question then I'd like to Then you would have raise. had your constitutional question, because the president said that he didn't care how the vote came out. Do you feel that uh, there was some question raised uh, uh, after the Gulf War that uh, there would be a high political price to be paid for those who had oh, yeah. voted against? Do yeah. you feel that this played a role in your defeat? In I don't think so. No, no, I think uh, pig valve is the sole cause of my defeat, and the figures show it because you know, I, was, I, I was something six, seven points ahead when I went in the hospital. And no, no, and, and it's important to say that, not to alibi about the election. Uh, I came back to the state right after that, and the, the Washington Post sent one of their better reporters to follow me around and show how bad it was. I got applause everywhere when I said, told them why I, you know, stood up and did what I did, and I never failed. And, and I, once or twice, somebody would stand up in the audience where we were having these more or less town meetings and make a little speech uh, in appreciation of my stating that view. Uh, no, it, didn't, it did not have a bad reaction, and I think most people that thought about it appreciated the fact that I uh, would say what I thought ought to be. I, you know, it, the truth of the matter, if they'd carried that war out as they intended to for three or four more days, we would have had tremendous losses. We might have, we might have put an end to that dictatorship, which we didn't do. You know, one reason that war sort of felt, fell short, they thought uh, from a political point of view and a partisan point of view, they thought that that war was going to carry them through the elections in 92. Uh, that this was the great thing that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, two or three of them said, we're going to continue to have parades all through the summer and fall, meaning until Election Day. But it didn't work out that way. I think people finally saw that, you see, you get in a very difficult situation uh, when the war, when our troops are, are put at risk, and having been there as you, you were, you know very well that uh, uh, people out there fighting don't care a thing about any more political discussion. They want support. And so it's always an awkward thing to say you don't want to go to war if indeed we end up going. But I don't think we ought to have gone, and I don't think we really accomplished anything except to put the Amir back on his throne and. If I'd have had my way, I'd have turned the country over to the people. You, you probably suffered from uh, less political fallout because of your, your own history as a paratrooper. 
Well, it was, it's fairly hard to say that uh, he didn't have the nerve to fight or, you know, whatever they would have said. But uh, I think that helped, uh, and I, I certainly didn't hesitate to remind people. Yeah. Could, could we, I bring you back in time to uh, when you were demobilized as a paratrooper and uh, faced um, all sorts of different prospects for your career? Can you describe your thinking and, and Well, you, you see, I, uh, by that time, I was pretty well set. I had two years of law school, so I had made my decision. Now, prior to going to law school, I looked at all kinds of things. I wanted to be a, a Boy Scout executive, and uh, they said they didn't have any vacancies. And uh, I wanted to uh, be a, uh, Esso was, uh, uh, Esso Standard Oil then, Exxon now, was recruiting people to go to South America, and my Spanish wasn't good enough, fortunately. Um, then I, I, I like to tell students now applying for law school, I ran a boys camp with Bill McCatherine, who was later uh, our director of selective service in North Carolina. And uh, at the end of at my senior year, we were, were running this camp, and um, the end of the summer came, and I suddenly said to myself, what am I going to do now? You know, it's, I thought we could make a big business out of this camp that we might have if the war hadn't come along. But so I come on back to Chapel Hill and I say to these students over there, would you do these applications for me? I said, so I walked in the dean's office and I said, Miss Lucy, I believe I'll go to law school. She said, fill out this form. <laughs> and so I went to law school two years before the war. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, so I pretty well knew I was going to come back and, and uh, do that. And I had worked for Albert Coates at the Institute of Government. And he had been extremely nice to me. And uh, he was counting on my coming back and, and being an assistant director of the Institute of Government. And, uh, and that then became my difficult choice of whether I would stay at Chapel Hill or whether I'd go out in the cold world. Well, the cold world appeared, appealed to me, so I went to, I picked me out of town. I, I, I didn't have any particular connections, so I chose Fayetteville for lots of different reasons. It turned out to be good reasons, and started practicing law by myself. Mm -hmm. And when did you find your first opportunity to, uh, to follow this dream of becoming a governor? What were the first steps? Well, uh, Two or three fortunate things. Uh, you have to be lucky in politics, I suppose. Well, immediately when I got there, they were looking for, they were going to start a new National Guard company. And they put a little note in the paper that anybody that wanted to be the company commander, an infantry company, uh, meet at the court, meet at the city hall. I was the only one to show up, so I got the job. And uh, I was an infantry officer. And I got to all these boys, especially from kind of the middle income and from the section of uh, Massey Hill where the cotton mills had been. Great many of them were my National Guardsmen, N not solely. Then I got asked to be the chairman of the Red Cross. It was right after the war, lots of shortages of people to do things. So there I'd been practicing law six, eight months and asked me to be chairman of the Red Cross of Cumberland County. Fairly big operation because of Fort Bragg and all of the old uh, families, the ladies at Fedball were on the board of the uh, Red Cross. So I had the Massey Hill people and the Haymount Hill people and the first time I could run for the state senate in Cumberland County after I got there I ran and won. Um, partially because of the National Guard and the American Red Cross and I was involved in a number of other things. So that's what I made my move. Now, had I not won, I might have gone some, done some, you know, I might have just been a practitioner and done other things. But I did win. And then we had a peculiar law in North Carolina at that time that had been there since the 20s. They called it a rotation agreement. So some of the counties, not all of them, but some few of the counties had worked out rotation agreements so that a senator could serve only every other time. We had four counties, uh, Brunswick and Columbus and uh, Bladen and Cumberland. Cumberland's bigger than all three of them. Mm 
but they had two senators, and two of them, and one uh, diadem would come from Cumberland and Bladen, and then Columbus and Brunswick. So I couldn't be reelected, uh, which was a very fortunate thing, because then I didn't have to go up there and, and make any more enemies by voting against things, and I could get on with running for governor. And so uh, that would have been, uh, uh, I was elected in uh, 50, served in, in, in 53, and then in, in 60 I ran for governor. In the meantime, uh, I managed Carr Scott's campaign for the U.S. Senate, and that was a successful campaign, and it gave me uh, contacts in every county. So I had, going in that by then, I had a pretty good statewide organization. I also, for students that might want to know how to go about it, I'd been very active in the Junior Chamber of Commerce, and every summer at the National Guard encampment, I made certain that I got to know the Wilkesboro people and the Asheville people and things of that kind. And I had two or three ways to, to begin to make statewide contacts. And of course, I'd met a good many people when I served in the state Senate. Governor Sanford, one of the things that people say who've been observing politics over the last 30 or 40 years is that something something major has happened to our political conversations and uh, this is reflected to some extent in public opinion polls that show that people don't have as much confidence in their uh, political representatives and maybe that the nature of uh, the political profession has deteriorated uh, and the political dialogue may not be of the same high, high order it once was. I wonder if, if you would reflect on your experience in politics uh, uh, since 1950, and whether you think there's anything to that uh, generalization, uh, what do you think has changed, and uh, what do you think has been for the better or for the worse? Well, there were some very vicious, mean campaigns back around the turn of the century, uh, and uh, you had um, uh, the race issue at, at such an intensity then that there wasn't any any question that that issue could get discussed, including the education of, of blacks. And uh, so all was not uh, as simple and, and wonderful and clean as maybe we like to think. Um, uh, Judge Walter Clark, just reading his book, book about him the uh, other night, and uh, he uh, put up with all kind of abuse. Uh, he was a Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice and fairly, f very forward-looking person f for the time. And uh, he, uh, including the race issue, for that period of the history was a pretty tough time to have an honest thought expressed. Uh, so uh, now looking at uh, more recently, do you know there could hardly have been a nastier campaign than some that the elder Talmadge did in Georgia. Um, South Carolina's had that kind of a climate a long, long time where they really beat up on one another. Uh, North Carolina, you don't have to go back to the Frank Graham election to remember that uh, uh, maybe those things dim in our memories. And I think it's pretty bad, and, and my own uh, sense of the Senate and the uh, collegial atmosphere that I saw when I would go up there after Scott was elected. I, of course, didn't go up there in a job, but I'd go up there every two or three weeks. I, I represented the coastline. I had a pass so I could ride to Washington at night and visit around and come back the next night. And I, I kept up with it, and it seemed to me that uh, people on both sides were were very civil and, and cordial to one another. I didn't find that uh, when I was up there. Uh, there was just a, a, a lot of uh, rancor, a lot of uh, um, uh, effort to be in opposition just to be in opposition, very little uh, motivation to be cooperative. Now, there were some extremely good people on both sides that attempted to bridge those differences. Uh, 
Uh, and I can, you know, I remember with great fondness the, the half a dozen or so Republicans that I just put in the top right rank of, of proper statesmen. But uh, there was that meanness, this mean spirit. And, and I'd like to think, if you've got to find an explanation, that a lot of it comes out of the talk shows and the people are beginning to analyze that. I don't know that I uh, have been in it de deeply enough to prove that point, but there are something like 2,000 call-in radio talk shows, and I've listened to a few of them. I can hardly stand to listen to them. It's just uh, full of stupidity and meanness and nastiness. Uh, uh, condemning the Congress, condemning the President, condemning everything else just about. I don't know whether we've got too much communication or not. It, it, that could be, but there, there may not be a, a simple answer. You know, uh, uh, how in the world do you explain what's happened in Yugoslavia after all those years, how bitterness won't go away? And I see that developing in this country uh, that I hope is not uh, true. The kind of uh, the bitterness, the kind of resentment, the kind of meanness that uh, could carry over into more severe uh, consequences. But it's mean enough in politics now. Uh, Governor Sanford, one of the things you said earlier on was that uh, President Johnson had modeled uh, his own war on poverty program over some of the things that you had done in North Carolina. I wonder if you'd talk to us about the North Carolina Fund and how that started and the ways in which you saw that uh, initiative uh, speaking to some of the abiding questions that you were concerned about? I had uh, been very much bothered by the level of poverty that you could not avoid seeing. Uh, not only did I grow up in a, a town where it had its share of, of people living in poverty, both black and white. Uh, and then I began to uh, um, look at it in a broader sense and perhaps a more academic sense, but nonetheless uh, the, uh, the sad story of, of lives that simply weren't fulfilled uh, bothered me and it seemed to me that we had a chance to do something about it. And again, I think it was John Ely that uh, brought to me the idea of the Ford Foundation uh, uh, gray areas program they called it. They had uh, a community in uh, Philadelphia, they had uh, New Haven, they had a, a, a community in Oakland and several others and they were attempting to do things to lift up the opportunities and to uh, alleviate the problems of poverty and it looked to me as if this was something that we could do on a statewide basis, that we could give it a rural element uh, that uh, it hadn't so far had. So I went up to see uh, the president of the Ford Foundation. And I said, I didn't come up here to get any money. Uh, I just came up here to get some ideas. How about sending uh, Paul Elvisaka and some people down to, uh, to talk to us about what we can do and look at the situation? Well, we ultimately got five million dollars for from, uh, for the program, and I think Carnegie put two million in it. And the uh, Reynolds uh, family and foundation put another several million in. And we designed a, the general concept of what we were trying to do, but we left it to the local communities to come up with a plan and we announced that this is a pilot program that my basic philosophy was that we don't want to start anything new we want to show how we can use our existing agencies health care which of course goes back to prenatal care uh, the employment services instead of just filling out slips and uh, uh, if something comes along call somebody actively uh, participate in finding a job and better yet finding a training to improve the job uh, possibilities and finding medical care where that was the uh, deterrent uh, and being an active organization so that uh, and the schools and education and the Head Start concept 
uh, all came out of these early discussions of how we would uh, go about uh, giving people better opportunities, but it was sort of a generalized uh, approach, uh, trying not to put a pattern down that uh, local communities would just follow, looking for creative ideas. And I think we said we could uh, fund 17, uh, maybe 15, but something like that. We got 76 uh, proposals. And, and of course we had to stick to our original figure because otherwise we would have spread it uh, beyond uh, the capacity to support it adequately and we wouldn't have had any results. And what I wanted to do was to demonstrate that the state agencies could uh, get the job done if we would charge them with it and structure it so they knew they had to get it done. We uh, deliberately said this is a five-year project. We don't want it to go on and on. This is not a new agency. This is an effort, um, a vast task force, if you will, to show how it could work. And one of the major components became the neighborhood uh, uh, projects where we bypassed uh, the local government mm -hmm. and that became an issue a couple of times and I remember meeting with the county commissioners from a county and the people who had proposed it and I, I came down strong on the side of giving it to the community group and we all but invented that concept that later was picked up and uh, finally was the downfall because places like Chicago uh, uh, bitterly opposed uh, bypassing local governments. You, well, you had to bypass local governments. On the other hand, in bypassing them, I can point out examples today, now that's we're a generation later, I can point out examples where people, for the first time, organized in a way that brought out leadership capabilities. Those people today are doing things right, right in Durham, I can cite examples and in northeast of North Carolina and in Fayetteville and uh, anyhow we we had this project going. Then uh, President Johnson comes in and uh, declares that he's going to start a war on poverty which I thought was wonderful. You, you know uh, uh, Johnson was an extremely compassionate man. Uh, he uh, had come up with uh, among people of hard times and he remembered all of that. And um, so he was, to, uh, he was going to make this a national program. I began for the first time to understand some of the problems of uh, trying to, to make a program, a social program nationwide because uh, it began to lose its zip. Uh, people were looking for high paid jobs. You know, we thought we'd pay these people about $8,000 in, uh, in 1960, 61. That's a fair amount of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, the governor got 25000 and it was 15000 when Hodges was governor. So the president of the university got 20 something, like two or 3000 So they were pushing these salaries up to around $20,000, and you were, you were developing a bureaucracy that we, of course, weren't developing here. Uh, I think that I had two or three thoughts about how we would rearrange all of that after it slipped because of the Vietnam War, and I never have come back to it, but I think we could run a nationwide effort, not all the same way, doing things to alleviate and eliminate uh, poverty, and, and we never did call ours a war on poverty, we called ours a war on the causes of poverty. Then you had the target focused and you, you uh, knew what you were trying to do. I think it all was a good effort and all successful uh, as far as it went. The trouble with the war on poverty is we quit. I'll the Head Start, for example, started. is a product of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I can say that that was started in North Carolina. If not, it might have been started in one of the gray areas and we picked it up. In any event, we did get it going. Now, the big pro it's, it's very successful. I, I've done 175 studies showing that it was successful and is successful. Trouble is, we never funded more than about 20% of the need. So you've got 80% of the people who are at risk that ought to have that kind of training that aren't getting it. And I kept trying in the Senate to increase the appropriations. 
finally the president increased it and announced a great increase. It rose from 20 percent to 22 uh, percent. We simply have got that opportunity that we haven't used and uh, the Job Corps. Uh, in fact, the Job Corps all but went underground to keep from being abolished in the Reagan-Bush years. Uh, and Carl Rowan wrote a, a piece saying we ought to revive the the Job Corps program, and we had them all over the country. He just didn't know it. We had four in North Carolina. I, I've visited all of them, but they kept a very low profile during that cutting period, and they survived. Now that catches only that catches a segment of uh, children who come from de deprived situations, mostly of the high school age. Uh, we haven't gone back to anything like the CCC, which was one of the great. Uh, accomplishments of the New Deal. You took, a, the, you took the whole uh, strength of a generation almost and, and saved it with that kind of an effort. So all of those ideas were good ideas. Uh, the next time we got to be careful that there's some way to, to keep the bureaucracy from developing around it that uh, tends to destroy the effectiveness of it, or oh, even so it was very effective ought not to have been abandoned, and the good parts of it weren't. Do you, uh, uh, your reference to the CCC, uh, do you think that the uh, experiences uh, you had during the New Deal and, and, and learning about the New Deal uh, were important in generating some of the uh, ideas that then carried over into your governorship? Oh, there's no question about it. There's no question that uh, the sense that uh, we could do something to improve the opportunities of people, which is maybe the basic lesson of the New Deal, no question that, uh, that I believe that very strongly and that uh, almost everything I've done officially has been based on that philosophy that, that we improve the state by improving opportunities for people. And I don't mean just people in the lower levels at, at, at all. Op education essentially is just that. We improve the community by improving individual opportunities. What you, what's gone wrong in the sense that these programs today have become the targets of so much political uh, criticism? There appears to be evidence that declining public support. You mentioned the growth of bureaucracy around those programs. Are there other things that, the other lessons that we should learn uh, uh, about things that maybe have gone wrong with these programs. It's so difficult to to uh, to find a way to keep a program refreshed, uh, to keep it uh, renewed, um, and um, uh, if you don't find a way to do that, these things do fall into uh, um, a less effective uh, uh, mode. Uh, the welfare program is a pretty good example, but I think it's not just the bureaucracy. Um, somehow, uh, you've got to be compassionate, of course. This ought to be a compassionate nation. We ought to care about people. We ought not to, you know, it's interesting to me that, that we turn all out in a disaster such as a flood, but we don't turn all out in a disaster such as slums and lost opportunities for young people, and somehow we we don't get stirred up about that when there's just as much more, far more nationwide devastation from slums and neglect and now drugs than from all the natural disasters. How do you get people to look at this disaster and the same with the same compassion and concern and uh, uh, desire to do something uh, that we find in the California floods and the earthquakes and the other natural disasters. I don't know how you keep that stirred up. I do know that uh, the, the philosophy of the welfare program was paternalistic. Uh, they thought they needed to embrace those people and protect them, and I never did think that was the right way. And we had a, a wonderful person that headed the welfare program in North Carolina, Dr. Ellen Winston, who went to become Kennedy's commissioner, whatever they called it at that time, but I think it was commissioner of, of public assistance or some, whatever it was before it became part of a department. And uh, she uh, 
very strongly believe that you had to have that paternalistic uh, concept, that they, uh, they needed it. And I could, I could appreciate that, but I did not think that was the best way to, to do it. And I remember uh, when we passed the uh, welfare reform in uh, 86, uh, Moynihan, who of course was responsible for the legislation as the subcommittee chairman, said, I've been working on this bill for 25 years. And I said, so have I. <laughs> because uh, for 25 more years, really, I've been saying we aren't going about it the right way because we don't put enough, um, we don't urge enough uh, self-dependence. And, uh, but I think, you know, now we, it, it, the resentment ought not to be aimed at the people. The resentment ought not to be resentment. Uh, we ought to simply say that we can find a better way to do it. Uh, that's one uh, area. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, the, uh, well, I don't know whether this was, this, uh, nothing will come of the idea of developing orphanages all over, but that's a reaction of meanness uh, that uh, is evident in, in so many things, public television. Uh, why in the world would we give up all of the benefits that public television brings when it's so cheap the federal government pays such a small part of it? Uh, I don't know why people are mad, and, and we talked a little bit earlier about uh, the change in political climate, and this is part of it. This is the bad part of it. This is where harm is done. The good example is, is all of this uh, legislation that's called crime legislation. Now, I know we've got to have prisons, but that shouldn't be our central philosophy of what to do about crime, build more prisons. Uh, it shouldn't, three strikes and you're out is about as stupid a, an approach uh, to eliminating uh, crime as you could find. It doesn't have anything to do with eliminating crime. I, 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 and, I, you know, we, we more or less proved that in the 20s and 30s when New York had that kind of uh, law. And I can even remember the movies where the man was up for his third time and he becomes so vicious. Uh, in any event, it, it, it's a proven uh, wrong move. And here we are back again because it sounds good on the, on the stump. Uh, how do we focus people's attention on keeping people out of prison? What's, we were talking earlier about the, the political climate. We've been talking about specifically about programs of this kind. What role can political leadership do in trying to perhaps take the edge of meanness off the political dialogue that you've been talking about the, uh, and about the, the sort of mean-spiritedness of, of some of the discussion about specific programs. Is there, is there anything that we can do about this? I don't know. Um, I, had, uh, um, I had observed the uh, um, deterioration of the presidential nominating process we used to have long, drawn-out, uh, sometimes uh, bitter campaigns, but they were uh, pretty much controlled in the sense that they just weren't wild. Or when um, Taft thought that the, uh, the Taft people thought the Teddy Roosevelt people were going to storm the Republican uh, convention in uh, what would have been 1911, 1912, uh, 1912. they had barbed wire behind the flowers. <clears throat> uh, uh, so, you know, it wasn't all flowers and, uh, at that time, but uh, uh, by and large, and, and then we had a two-thirds rule that, uh, and the, uh, that extended the uh, votes uh, far beyond any reason. Uh, Woodrow Wilson would not have been nominated, though, except for the two-thirds rule, because Champ Clark had a majority on the first ballot. Now, did that change history? Or would Clark been a good, probably been a pretty good president, too? In any event, it was a much more uh, uh, orderly thing, and it didn't breed 
the kind of viciousness that the primary system does. And we got in the primary system uh, uh, after uh, Humphrey's defeat, and Humphrey misread uh, the Chicago Convention with the students out there, thinking that the students and others wanted to be a part of the convention. They didn't care a thing about, well, not some of them, of course, would have been pleased to go in, but they weren't there for that. They were there to oppose the war. And Humphrey set up uh, uh, this thing with Fred Harris as chairman of the party and uh, George McGovern to change the rules, and they changed the rules to the rowdy kind of a situation that we have now, which uh, I think is disgraceful. And a lot of this uh, meanness and bitterness and name calling comes out of the ordeal of the primary, presidential primaries. Uh, I would like to see us get back to representative, to the concept of representative government in the nominating process, which we had a long time. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't always uh, as, as representative as it should be and could be. Uh, for example, the, the delegates from Georgia, half were named by the chairman of the party and half were named by the governor. So that's not very democratic, but it could be a democratic process. And, I, and again, the disorderliness of it, I think, is detrimental. Uh, and we, we, we saw... Uh, uh, so we've seen that several times, and we certainly, the New Hampshire primary is, is a disgrace to democracy. What strategies did you use to offset the negative campaigning that was mounted against you? Laughed at it. Um, I think that's uh, the, the best way to handle it, ridiculed it. Um, I, um, I got in. I uh, certainly earned the um, lifetime uh, animosity f uh, when I uh, compared my opponent who arrived at a foot stomping uh, uh, rally in the warehouse in um, Smithfield, I think, in a white Cadillac uh, convertible, and I can compared him and said it sounded, to me it looked like a combination of uh, Daddy Grace and Senator Bilbo, and he <laughs> took offense <laughs> uh, with some justification, but my point was I wasn't trying to be mean, I was trying to be funny. And, um, and, and when I ran recently, this wasn't a mean campaign, but it's one I had to offset when the lady says, well, I just can't uh, uh, forgive him for the tax on food. This is 25 years later, you know, this is when I was running for the Senate. So I made a big thing. People laughed today out around when they mentioned a whiny old woman because I mocked the whiny old woman. And we never put an ad on to answer it, but we got it answered better than by laughing at it. And I think that's really about the only way to deal with these. And, and, and as a matter of fact, my inability to be on my feet dealing with the, that kind of ad, it didn't get offset this last time. I'm not saying that with any regret, but uh, that's the only way to handle it. You can't or you shouldn't handle it by putting on nasty ads of your own attacking that. And I think maybe uh, we've seen some mistakes made by good people who thought they would answer those ads with mean ads of their own. And I don't think, I think the, I've always thought that the real way to get at that was just a humorous uh, mm -hmm. treatment of it. And you can't always do that. And sometimes you've got, you could have a different kind of a, a treatment that uh, would jolt people into seeing how uh, wrong the ad was. I, I know, uh, um, Uh, well, I, uh, I, I don't really want to get in specific ads and things of that kind. I, I don't want to make this, uh, when people look at it 30 years from now, uh, if it lasts that long, uh, that I was here complaining about my political foes. But uh, I think you, uh, by and large, can, can laugh off those things. And, it, if, uh, and also you can uh, uh, prod people's... Uh, consciences a little bit uh, about the way you respond to a particularly bad racist ad. 
But that's the way you certainly, if you say, well, you got to fight uh, fire with fire, and I said no, su no successful fire department's ever done that. Right. They fight it with water. And I always thought you ought to fight those things with water. One of the things that uh, is interesting here is the, is the uh, change over time in the, in the amount of seconds that are given to a political statement on TV so that four years ago it was 37 seconds, or six years ago, two years ago it was nine seconds. So the sound bite has gone down and down and down, uh, which I think helps to uh, accentuate the, the negative snipe. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, I mean, probably one of Clinton's most successful speeches was the sermon he sort of gave at the Memphis church on issues of community and crime and civil mm -hmm. rights. It was a long speech, uh, but it gave him time to develop a point of, uh, a point of view. I wonder uh, uh, what your thoughts are about how we can get back to a, a dialogue in which candidates <coughs> are not doing something which is so totally scripted that it only has a utilitarian effect instead of uh, giving us something to well, think about. Well, some of the campaign reform uh, measures had uh, such uh, devices. Mm -hmm. One would simply be not to permit a 30-second spot. Uh, uh, that you uh, And when you try to say uh, a derogatory spot, you get into two or three problems, one of which is defining what you mean. The second is, uh, well, they will argue that sometimes you need something negative, that uh, there's a negative uh, feature here that uh, legitimately deserves to be brought out. Uh, I don't think there's much of that, and if so, you could bring it out in a, in a different way. But I, uh, I've, uh, I tried to, uh, it was obvious we weren't going to get any campaign reform passed, uh, and if so, Bush was going to veto it. Uh, I, try, I suggested maybe we could do it with Senate rules, that uh, Senate r rules can be much more flexible uh, and turn it over to the Ethics Committee. Uh, they have refused to seat people for improper campaigns, including a man I believe about the 20s, from, if I'm not mistaken, from Tennessee, but I may be mistaken about the state, for spending too much money. He spent something like a million dollars and they wouldn't seat him. Um, but we don't do that anymore. But this, but I don't know how you get rid of it. Um, it's a, it's a, certainly it's, it's a disgrace, well, a and it damages democracy. I imagine if some candidates were successful in having upbeat, non-negative campaigns, that that would be a lesson uh, taken to heart by other politicians. Well, yeah, but the. the, the the difficulty is uh, uh, that um, they don't win. You know, the reason people use negative campaigns, most everybody would uh, say they oppose a negative campaign, and most everybody reacts the way the person doing the campaign, the spot intended. They react to it. You know, somebody said about me, said, well, I didn't realize that about Governor Sanford. Well, of course he didn't realize it <laughs> because it wasn't true. He said, I can't vote for him. And this was a scurrilous spot, of course. So, some of the, uh, the news media have actually volunteered to hold back on uh, this kind of campaigning, but they also claim that there are federal laws that require them to run ads. Well, uh, I think we could have a different set of standards and, uh, and probably put that under some control, and if you just did away with them. Uh, you certainly got the constitutional authority to do away with a 30-second spot in a campaign. I expect you could do it. And, and two, you see, all of this campaign legislation is based on the fact that if you conform in order to get around that constitutional uh, provision of free speech, uh, if you conform you get certain benefits. One of the things in Boren's bill was that you got cheaper, you got the lowest rate in television, you got uh, more mailing privileges and other things to make it attractive to accept the limitations. Um, and w in presidential race, the same thing. You accept uh, certain requirements 
and you get the federal money. Uh, John Connolly wouldn't take it, you know, he spent his own money. And uh, people didn't react well to it either. It did him more harm than anything else that he was going to, because they saw that he was going to evade the rules, but we haven't got many rules. Are, are changes in the rules going to be sufficient? Let me just th throw out a what seems to me a bit of a puzzle. During the last election, we had relatively high employment. We had relatively low inflation. The country was at peace. All of this, by many of the past standards, this should have been an election in which the electorate would be reasonably kindly disposed to many incumbents, would be relatively satisfied and uninclined to accept some of the more inflammatory rhetoric and so on. And yet, it didn't, it didn't turn out that way. What's your explanation for this? Well, I think when historians begin to look at this election that they'll find that uh, there was a, a pretty cleverly orchestrated uh, and vicious uh, anti-incumbent, i.e. anti-democrat uh, effort by the Republican Party. I think that they'll consider this a great achievement in the way they orchestrated it. And I don't know that for a fact, but I, you know, it'll come out. Uh, and so there was just this constant barrage. Now, President Clinton invited some of it but at the same time, a whole lot of it was simply outrageous and unjustified and uh, disgraceful uh, and deliberate. Uh, I don't know how you stop that. Uh, Clinton himself has not been too uh, adept at, at stopping it and not too adept at defending himself and sort of rising above it. And I think it all caught him by so much surprise that nothing he'd ever seen in Arkansas like that. Uh, but I think he, you know, the, what's the answer? Let's see what he does with it. You know, he's, he's got the pulpit, he's got the opportunity to uh, uh, take the initiative, and uh, he may very well be able to. But again, you've got that uh, constant conflict in the political uh, sector that. Um, I don't know how you get rid of it. You can't ban it, and, and people won't get disgusted with it, though they say they are. But there are people who, who believe that the problems are a little bit deeper than simply the style of campaigning. Senator Boren, you mentioned, suggested not so long ago that he would not be surprised to see a major third party candidate win the presidency before too long, because simply because there is such a widespread disgust among the American public with the established parties that goes beyond simply the, the campaign rhetoric, that there's a mood in the country where, of, of discontent which only perhaps a third party, and it may be a third party with very simplistic Well, solutions. we've been through that before, as you know, uh, with the shifting of parties, and particularly in the last decade or two of the last century. And uh, we came out of it uh, with the two parties Actually, the Republican Party wasn't in existence until just before the Civil War. So we always shift, and not always, but we have shifted parties. That's no great disaster. Uh, if, um, on the other hand, um, uh, if I were able to uh, call the shots, I'd change the Democratic nominate. I mean, the presidential nominating process right now. And I think that would have a lot to do with uh, eliminating the opportunities for some of that bitterness. I don't know what I would do about campaign reform except to pass some, and I think any campaign reform would be an improvement, and some of uh, the reforms would be very, very good. But that, uh, anyhow, you're not going to do this totally by law and procedures. Governor, how do you see the changes in the state of North Carolina politically? Is, is there a, is this shift toward uh, Republicanism going to continue? Where do you see uh, North Carolina 10 years from now? Well, North Carolina's uh, always been a, a fairly conservative state in many ways, and at the same time a fairly forward-looking state compared to other southern states. 
Uh, I don't uh, dread a two-party system, and I for years have said uh, you, uh, we ought to have a two-party system, and it would be helpful to have a North Carolina two-party system. I just don't want the Republicans getting too strong. Uh, and that was more or less facetious. You expect uh, uh, if you're going to have a two-party system, you've got genuine competition. We always had competition in the Democratic Party. We had uh, factions, uh, faction may not be quite the word, but uh, the Broughton people, the Umpstead people, the Scott people, and um, I reckon to some extent the Sanford people. Uh, and so you had your own party, so to speak. Now it was easy to get in and out of those parties, but uh, the elections were decided here, essentially the conservatives and the liberals, if you will, uh, which was a better word in those days. You had uh, 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 Max Gardner running against Cam Morrison in uh, 1920. Uh, Gardner was uh, a bright, young, vigorous uh, person that I think had been the captain of the football team at State and then gone to law school at Chapel Hill and from a, an old family in Shelby and Cam Morrison, uh, uh, older person, but uh, long in politics, really from the red shirt days. Uh, not bad. As a matter of fact, he, he uh, uh, passed the first statewide uh, road bond in the country, and most of the foundation of our good roads started in the 1920s. But there you had two different people who very well could have been Republican and Democrat running against each other in the primary. And since that time, every primary until, I suppose, the turning point when a Republican threatened to win was when I won. And that was because, I think, uh, I know, we chose to support uh, President Kennedy's campaign, wide open and as part of our campaign, and, and again, just to look at figures then and figures now, a very nice fellow friend of mine was running on the Republican ticket, Bob Gavin, been a classmate of mine, was a good friend, stayed a good friend the rest of his life. Uh, but he, uh, he had about a third of the votes, not about two-thirds in the uh, July poll that we did. Uh, Nixon had about 60% uh, and Kennedy had about 32% and we decided we were going to reverse that. And I figured, well, you know, I can lose 10 points. What difference does it make? And it, finally, it, it, it began to worry me that it might make a difference. <laughs> but Gavin uh, finally got, uh, um, well, I got 55% of the votes and uh, President Kennedy got as I remember the figure, 50.54, but we carried him over and got the electoral votes. And it, but there you were seeing a Republican Party uh, come on, and already you were seeing it in the national side. The Nixon poll was good. Eisenhower uh, had carried North Carolina. Stevenson carried it uh, the first uh, time. I may be wrong about that, but anyhow. Uh, North Carolina voted for Herbert Hoover. Uh, so you were seeing a party develop, and, and not necessarily with uh, vicious causes of uh, division. Uh, so I never thought that a two-party system was anything but American, and I never did fear. I thought we could hold our own against honest competition, and I, I still think so. I don't, I don't, I see, I see no great, uh, peril for the nation in having a two-party system. I do think the Republican Party is dominated by an extreme uh, group that the rest of them embrace because they need them. Uh, you know, a great many people embrace this extreme right-wing business without believing in it, but they see that as a, a path to winning the Republicans, and people always think, once I get in office, then I can do right. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I see the viciousness as something bad for democracy. I don't see the two-party system as anything but good. When, and, and you know they'll mess it up, and the Democrats will be back. When did the Congressional Club become prominent in North Carolina? And what was your uh, 
your strategy in, in addressing it? Well, they didn't come along uh, uh, when, when I was running the people that supported uh, Dr. Lake, essentially, or the Congressional Club people, including Jesse. Uh, I, Jesse, at that time, was uh, an announcer for Channel 5, and he was constantly on me. And that station, I didn't think, treated me fairly. The, one of our spots they put on upside down, and all of them they put on at different hours. So at some point, I quit putting anything on, on that station. Um, I, I got along pretty well with Mr. Fletcher, who ran it personally for different reasons. Uh, and ultimately, he became very fond of Duke and did a lot of things for us and had some very good traits. But uh, he promoted Jesse, claimed he didn't have anything to do with it. Maybe he didn't. But uh, so anyhow, I quit advertising, and I carried every county in the general election and that whole coverage of that station. Uh, well, it proved, uh, I don't know what it proved. It might have proved television wasn't as important then as it is now. But Jesse's and the Congressional Club have been there since that time. That was probably the beginning of it. Now, it was some 20 years before Jesse ran. Uh, see, when he ran... 76, 78. When, uh, and Jesse, every time, has won on a lucky break. He was, of course, a Democrat, uh, as most everybody else was. And when uh, and he supported Willis Smith and went to Washington as Willis Smith's AA. Uh, and um, then he came back and worked for the bankers or whatever. And then Galifianakis, who was a, one of the brightest, promising young men in the state, uh, went to Duke, was teaching part-time, may still be at the law school, and lawyer in Durham, been in the legislature when I was governor, and a great ally, ran for Congress and won and was all for a brilliant career. And for reasons I never understood, he decided to run against Everett Jordan when Everett was almost on his last leg and shouldn't have done it. Um, and he did, and he won in the primary. And he offended a lot of the old timers and he offended the old guard and the people who weren't, didn't mind being a Republican anyhow had already voted for Hoover and other people in the between. Uh, so Jesse changed parties and ran and won. Didn't anybody know much about him except he was a conservative. Mm -hmm. And it was after that, as I recall, that they set up the Congressional mm -hmm. Club and got into this highly perfected money raising machine and playing the right, right wing uh, of the country for money. Uh, it's been a very successful venture in, in that respect. Uh, they've uh, done it in a professional way, uh, but he's had a lot of luck. Uh, the next time uh, he uh, ran, he uh, Luther Hodges was going to beat him, Junior. And Max Smith, McNeil Smith had run, and he had and Luther was emerging as the leader, but a lot of good people were running. They thought, you know, we get this fella now. And uh, Luther Hodges got the got into the second primary with John Ingram. Uh, John Ingram uh, is a nice enough fella, but he's he considered kind of an oddball. He was commissioner of insurance and all. The, he had a pretty bad reputation as being unpredictable. And he wasn't about to win a Senate race. He ran against me when I ran. Uh, got about the same number of votes. But in the second primary, who voted for him? The Helms people who were registered Democrats. So Helms didn't run against Luther Hodges Jr., who probably would have beat him, beaten him, ran against John Ingram. So that was the second lucky break. Then he ran against Hunt, and Hunt pretty well blew that campaign by, uh, well, in all fairness, Reagan was running. But that was a lucky break, too. And then he ran against Harvey Gatt. That was ideal for Jesse. He'd been waiting for that. So he's sort of lucked out. But uh, the Congressional Club, 
uh, though I certainly don't agree with their philosophy, uh, did a, a terrific job of organizing and, and doing it in a professional way. Maybe we, we could close by having you go back briefly to uh, the moment that you were able to act on that somewhat tempered dream you had to become president and talk a little bit about uh, the 72 campaign that you ran against George Wallace when, and, how, and how that campaign in some ways embodied what you think politics are about. Well, um, you might very well say that it was an example that you ought not to go hunting half-cocked <laughs> um, because, um, number one, I was president of Duke. I really couldn't take off and campaign uh, too much. I, maybe if I were going to do that kind of thing, I ought to have uh, taken leave, but I thought I could handle it all. Well, I, and, and again, you know, I really didn't have that burning gut feeling that I had when I was running for governor. I'd stay up all night if necessary. And so, uh, but, the, but the big problem was that um, Shirley Chisholm came in the campaign and there was not any way with the black vote split that I could win. And I knew that. And I didn't know how, she shouldn't have come in here. She later said to me, well, I'm, I'm sorry about it, but I had to do it. And because had she come in here and had the black vote not been split, as it was, with my getting maybe more than half of it, uh, she would have gotten 15%. She would have gotten some delegates under our rules, North Carolina rules. And she wanted those delegates. And one of my great supporters, John Wheeler, is the one that urged her to come in, and he uh, he never he really never got over that. I forgave him in a hurry. I mean, I could understand that, but I think he never got over it. But I named him as the first black from North Carolina to a national convention, and I gave him great support, and he gave me great support. But he he got carried away with this idea of, of this black woman being on the ticket, which was of course a foolish dream. But that's what killed that campaign. And once I didn't carry North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other problem was I had trouble getting taken seriously. People say, oh, he's just on an ego trip. There's no chance that he can be president. Nobody in the South is going to be elected president. Well, of course, they were wrong. One fellow, because I went by to see him and spent the night with him, later said, well, I figured if Sanford could do it, I could do it. And that was Carter. Well, from my, from my, my recollection of that campaign was that uh, uh, it was a time when you made all of us proud because you stood up for things that were right and needed to be said, and you uh, uh, did the kinds of things you had to do in order to be true to yourself. Yeah, but I ought, to have, uh, I ought to have done it in a more professional manner, and I ought to have done it in a more concentrated manner. And I don't know whether we could have uh, defeated him. You see, that they changed the rules and uh, didn't require people to put a petition to get on the ballot. They finally decided, oh, we got all these people that want to get on, let's just put them all on. Well, that was a terrible blow to me. If I'd have been here just with Wallace, I believe I could have defeated him. I believe we could have focused it, um, but we didn't. And uh, I have uh, learned uh, and probably learned when I was uh, a boy that never looked back. And I, I never ever regretted any of it. And I don't know what I would have done with the car if I'd have caught it. Well, we, I spec we, I spec we could have handled it, but uh, we know that Duke University benefited from this, and we we'd like to thank you, Governor, for your sitting for us for this uh, Living History interview. Well, you know, we haven't talked much about Duke, uh, but I would have to say that as I look back over uh, my life so far, I hope it's a whole lot more. Uh, but so far. Duke, of course, has been the fulfillment of my life. Uh, being governor was great for four years, but you can't make a life out of four years. I, I at least was here long enough to feel I was a part of it, and and, uh, and uh, I certainly I, I would have left to the Duke to be president, but I wouldn't have left Duke to be vice president, uh, and said so. Uh, I don't know that I was offered it. Oh, but um, 
uh, and, and I said at the time I'd rather be unemployed than be in the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, I'd like to uh, thank you on behalf of the Living History Program. I'd like to thank Professors Chafe and Holstey, uh, Professor uh, Richard Watson for uh, running the, leadership, the, the Living History Program and the technical staff. Thank well, thank much. you, and thank all of you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Too bad they're recording it. <laughs> <laughs>